Bible with you this morning, I invite Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to read the first three verses together. By the way, uh, after chapel this morning, my mom will have some of those Everybody Duck cassettes on sale in the lobby. So she's been holding on to those since 1994, and she's anxious to liquidate them. Yes. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 says this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Would you pray with me as we begin? God, we praise you for your grace. We praise you for the song that was just sung, the artist that wrote the song, the artist that, uh, that led us just a moment ago. In a week where we are focused on Thanksgiving, God, everything we know and everything we have, uh, we receive as recipients of your grace. It's all, the, the, the air in our lungs and the blood in our veins and the opportunity to sing and to enjoy beautiful art and to breathe in the air, God, all of it uh, is, is something we have to be thankful for because apart from you, we would have nothing. And so God, we are grateful, not only for the creation, for the opportunity to know you, to hear your voice, God, but for the opportunity to listen to your voice in an ongoing way. And we do that now as an act of worship. We turn our attention to your word and we pray that you would be glorified in our worship of you through the study of your word. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. You know, there are a lot of voices sort of vying for our attention, especially in the day and age in which we live. There are a lot of different people that are constantly speaking, and we have more access to information than any uh, group of people that have ever lived, you know, with Google. I mean, you Googled some things about me that I would had just have preferred to keep secret, but it's fine. Um, we have so much access that it requires us to pay really careful attention to what voices we listen to. Um, because there are always people speaking and there's always more information and there's always more being fed us and sometimes we can get to a place where we sort of, uh, we, we become absent-minded in our followership of particular voices. So uh, not too long ago, I was driving to a friend's house to watch a, a boxing match and I'd never been to his house before. I turn on the GPS, the Google you know, assistant thing and I'm driving there, I hit, turned up the music. You know and how the Google assistant works, it just kind of speaks over the music. So uh, as I'm driving, the, uh, the assistant on Google comes on and she says, uh, you know, in 400 feet, turn right on Richfield Drive. And so I, you know, I just, 400 feet, I turned right on Richfield. And then she says, uh, at the next turn, turn right on Seminole, uh, Seminole Way. And so I turn right on Seminole Way. And she says, in 200 feet, turn right on Plum Avenue. And so I turn right on Plum. And I'm driving and singing along the music, anxious to see the boxing match. She says, uh, then in, in, uh, at the next turn, turn right on Trailway. And so I turned right on Trailway and I drove for a little ways. And then uh, the Google Assistant says, in 400 feet, turn right on Richfield Drive. And so I turn right on Richfield Drive. And she said, at the next right, turn right on Plum. You know? And so then I turn right on Plum. And then she, she says, in 200 feet, turn right on Trailway. And so I turn on Trailway. And uh, all of a sudden, after I'd done basically a square, uh, like three times over, I realized like, I feel like I've seen all these houses before. And so I pull over, I didn't, I didn't break the law, I pull over, I grab my phone and I look at it and literally, you know how the Google Maps, it does like a blue line to wherever you're going? I'm just in a blue box, right? Somewhere along the way, Google just decided we're gonna travel, literally, I could have been traveling that same route the rest of my life, right? <laughs> I would have needed like trail mix in the car just to survive over time. Um, if, because what, I was just sort of blindly following her directions and she put me into a loop that never got me to my friend's house. I had to turn it off and research it to get to the right place. And, and I feel like there are all kinds of ways in our lives where we end up listening to voices that sort of trap us in a loop. You know what I'm talking about? We end up sort of following the voices and the directions of people who, who somewhere along the way have sort of gotten off track. And so it behooves each and every one of us to pay attention to the right voices and to understand who is speaking, who we're listening to, and where that person is leading us. 
As I was preparing uh, my message for this morning, one of the things that was asked of me was to reflect in some way upon this incredible renovation. And this is the first time this morning, it's the first time I've been in this room since the renovation was done. Uh, I'd seen the stuff online and the video and sort of the projections of what, what it could look like, you know, the artist's renderings before it was completed, but nothing that I'd seen in advance prepared me for sort of the awe of walking in here this morning. And I know when it comes to true art, everybody has their own opinion, I'm not interested in yours. Let me just tell you mine. Uh, <laughs> I walked in this morning and, and literally was kind of dumbfounded by the light in this room, um, by, the, by the different representations in each one of these pieces, but probably m- most of all by the piece that sits right behind me. This piece here behind me is called Resurrection. And, and it doesn't really distract you. It kind of just draws you in, but it's just radiant, right? It's radiant. And so as I was looking at the things that the artists had said about the work before they completed it, one of the things they talked about was the way they wanted everything to sort of center on this particular message, the resurrection of Christ. And so each one of these pieces in a different way speaks to the truth of the resurrected Christ. And my mind immediately goes then to Hebrews chapter one. Hebrews one, one is one of my favorite verses in all of the scripture, one and two in particular, where it says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. That's an incredible truth. The fact that the creator of the universe speaks in a way that the creation can understand is in and of itself profoundly mystifying, right? That when God speaks, we aren't just incinerated. That when God speaks, we can comprehend some of what he's said. But it's amazing that we don't have an absent God. They don't have a God that just set the earth spinning and then walked away from it, but that long ago and in various ways, he has continued to speak. That throughout the ages, God has wanted to be known by his creation, and he's had some things that he wants to say to us, ways in which he wants to guide us. It's as long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. There was a plethora of different prophets. There were all kinds of different ways in which God spoke, sometimes through a burning bush, sometimes through a talking donkey, sometimes through a prophet, sometimes through a pillar of fire. You know, God, God's speaking in profound ways, but God was speaking. Then the writer goes on to say, God has always spoken, right? He's always spoken through these various and sundry ways. But look at verse two. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. The author, the writer of the Hebrews, is trying to show us a juxtaposition. He's trying to wake us up to the reality that God has spoken and that now God has said something so much more profound and so much more beautiful that it truly is the clearest articulation of God that his creation will ever know, right? God has spoken through the prophets, he has spoken through the donkeys, he has spoken through burning bushes, but now the writer says, and I want you to see the finality of that, but now he's spoken to us through his son. The old message was in some ways fragmentary and incomplete. We were seeing glimpses of it, and as we look around the room, you can see glimpses of the truth in all of these stories. The story of Cain and Abel, the story of Abraham and Isaac, right? We see these glimpses, Elijah and the child that's raised, the widow's son that's raised from the dead. We see glimpses all throughout the Old Testament. We see pointing signs, flashing arrows that were pointing ahead to a greater truth. And in this room, surrounded by this artwork, we have the opportunity to capture some of these glimpses again. God has spoken through various and sundry ways but they're fragmentary, they're a piece of the story, they're a flashing signpost or an indicator pointing ahead to something greater. Sometimes they're types and sometimes they're symbols, but they're always pointing ahead to something greater than themselves. God has spoken, but that speaking in the Old Testament is fragmentary, incomplete, it's indirect, it's ongoing and preparatory. But now, he says, in these last days, now, something different, something different than a lot of different messages coming through a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. That's how God's spoken in the past. Now it says in verse two, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God's final, God's complete, God's most perfect message, his complete word to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, for all the promises of God and find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory, right? All the promises of God, all the things that were being foreshadowed, all the things that were being typified, all the things that God was pointing us to find their realization in the person of Christ. 
That final word is the Lord Jesus himself. As we see in John chapter one, in John one, speaking of the Lord Jesus, this is the way John, by the way, does his, uh, this is the way he does his Christmas story in John one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. We see in verse 14 that that word became flesh. That Jesus is God's speaking action, right? He is the active voice of God. Jesus is the clearest, most beautiful, most articulate thing that God has ever said or will ever say. And so when we're thinking about all of the different voices that are coming our way today, all the different things you could Google, all the different people that are giving you their theories and their ideas and their different speculations, all the TV channels and all the podcasts and all of the XM radio stations, we're taking in all of this input and it behooves us to know what's the most important voice? What's the most important voice? How do I attune my life to the right thing? Because I don't just want to hear other created beings' opinions about things, right? I don't want to just other hear other people's speculation, other people who are just as broken, in me, broken as me, other people who are just as flawed as me. I don't necessarily want their opinion all the time. I want to know what God says. And God speaks, and he has spoken to us through his son. The very word of God is Jesus. Think about that for a second. I want to talk about things to be thankful for. Thankful for the fact that God's word is Jesus. He says Jesus to us. He speaks Jesus to us. In the past, he spoke through prophets. In the past, he spoke through various and sundry means. But now, he's spoken a complete, a final, a direct, a finished word. There were many prophets, but there is one son, right? There were many types, and there were many signs. But there is one complete word, and it's Jesus. Jesus is the pinnacle of all that God will communicate. And I love the fact that Jesus himself, one of these, uh, I think it maybe is the one on the inside wall here, depicts the Emmaus dinner, right? Jesus meets with these men after the resurrection and he walks with them on the road and then they invite him to come and have dinner, but they don't know, they don't know who he is, right? They don't know who he is. I love in that story on the Emmaus road that Jesus, it says in uh, Luke 24, 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's a course I'd like to take, by the way, right? That is a class I would love to take. Jesus is the professor, and he sits down at a table with you, and he goes, okay, let's start in Genesis, right? We'll start with the writings of Moses, and we're going to work our way through, and I'm going to show you where I am revealed on every page of everything else that has been revealed. Every place where it pointed ahead to me. Isn't that, that's a master class right there, right? Jesus sat with them and showed them, beginning with the prophets and Moses, all the way through where he was revealed in all that had been revealed prior. So it makes sense then for us to pay attention to what God has said. Who is this Jesus? And the writer of the Hebrews gives us a couple of things. In fact, he gives us uh, seven descriptors here, and I just want to look at them in in the time that we have. Listen to the way that this final, complete, most beautiful articulation of God is described here in Hebrews chapter 1. It says in Hebrews 1, in these last days, verse 2, he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things. That's the first descriptor, the heir of all things. I think about one of these glasses that shows uh, David playing the harp for Saul. And the artist, when they prepared that particular piece of stained glass, when he, when he described why he was writing, he says this is to indicate the fact that Saul looked at David and knew another king was coming, Right? knew another king was on the way. But the story of Saul and David is only a type. It's one of those things that Jesus would have pointed out to the men on the Emmaus Road and said, here I am, and the pages of this story that you know, but I am the king that is truly to come from the lineage of David, right? The heir of all things. Jesus owns it all. It's funny how much time you and I spend trying to hold on to our stuff, right? Or how much of our culture is divided by people trying to hold on to their stuff. You know, the reality is that you and I are the heir of none of it. That Jesus owns it all. We're fighting over things that don't belong to us, that are essentially on loan to us. Because he, he is the heir of all things. I love in Matthew 28, in the, in the midst of the Great Commission, when Jesus looks at his disciples and says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given, who? To me, he says, to himself, right? And then he says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything which I've commanded you. And he says, and lo, I will be with you always 
even until the end of the age. I love the fact that Jesus sandwiches what we, what we typically quote as the Great Commission. He sandwiches it between two truths, that he has all the power and he's with us always. Right? He has all the power and he's with us always. Listen, it doesn't matter what you put between those two truths, it becomes infinitely doable, right? If Jesus had said, hey, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, I'm the heir of all things. Go ye therefore and ride your bicycles to Hawaii and I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. You know what we'd be capable of doing? Riding our bikes to Hawaii. Why? Because he has all the power and he's with us always. Jesus is the heir of all things. Not only that, look at what it says next in verse two. The heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. I think it's really interesting that the heir of all things comes before the creator of all things. We know that Jesus is the creator. We see that in Colossians 1. Colossians 1, 15 and following says, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We know that he's the creator, right? Jesus is the creative force. Talk about the creativity in this room. It pales in comparison. As beautiful as it is, it pales in comparison to the creative power of the Lord Jesus. But the fact that air comes before creators is telling us something about the fact that he's the heir of more than just what we see and know. He's the heir of all things, not just the creation. It includes the creation, but it's broader in scope even than that. That Jesus was there in the beginning, right, John 1 says. He owns it all. He's the heir of it all. Even before it was created, it belonged to him. Heir and creator. I love the idea of of the creation of Jesus. We see that represented in the story of the, uh, the widow's son raised to life by Elijah here. The power of life. To give life where there was none. That God always was pointing ahead to the fact that I'm the one who started this thing and I'm the one who will sustain it, right? He is the heir of all things, the creator of all things. Look at what it says in verse three, back to Hebrews chapter one, verse three. He's the radiance of the glory of God, right? The radiance of the glory of God. It talks in... um, It talks in 2 Corinthians chapter four about some of the witness that you and I have in replicating this radiance. 2 Corinthians chapter four, verses four through six say, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I love the fact that what is shining out of you and I who are followers of the Lord Jesus is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, right? That that's what radiates out of us. He is the radiance of God's glory, it says in Hebrews chapter one. Not only that, he's the radiance of the glory of God, verse three, and the exact imprint of his nature. So many people trying to discover what God is like, right? Trying to, you know, sort of read cloud formations and sort of do their own interpretation of what God might be like, and yet God has revealed himself in very specific and articulate ways. We spend a lot of time sort of theorizing and postulating about what God might be like, and there are thousands, if not millions of books that are written about what he might be like. And yet Jesus has made him known. John 1 says that as well. Nobody's ever seen him, but the one who sits at his right hand has made him known. I love the story in the Gospels, in John chapter 14, where the, uh, the disciples look at Jesus and they go, hey, are you ever gonna, you ever gonna show us the Father? You know, we'd kinda like to know what that's like. It says in John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, Uh, Well, they say to him in verse eight, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. And in 14, nine, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? You wanna know what God is like? Look at Jesus, the clearest, most loving, most articulate, beautiful thing God has ever said. In the past, God spoke to us through various and sundry means. He spoke to us through the prophets. All of those things were pointing ahead to his final and complete word, which is the Son, Jesus. The heir of all things, the creator of all things. The radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Look at this in three, it says, he upholds the universe 
by the word of his power. And I think sometimes we sort of get the idea of like Atlas with the globe on his back that he's holding all of those things together. But that's not exactly what's meant. It doesn't mean that he's physically holding up the world by his strength. But like we saw in Colossians chapter one, he's carrying all things to their redemptive end. And that's great news for you and I because we're all broken, each and every one of us. We live in this world. You're shopping at the same targets I'm shopping at. You're pumping gas at the same gas stations I'm pumping gas at. The brokenness of mankind, myself included, is always on display in front of me. And so I find great hope in recognizing that the Lord Jesus not only created all things, he not only sustains all things, but he is carrying all things to their redemptive end. We see the, uh, the, the story of Cain and Abel. It might be on this one here, right here on, on the inside the murder of Cain and Abel. And you look at that story and you think, man, what a tragedy that God even gives Cain the warning and says, hey, bud, sin is knocking at your door and if you don't get control of it, it will take you captive. And Cain goes ahead and does the selfish thing, the envious and jealous thing that he wants to do and he murders his brother. But the great news for us is that even in the brokenness that's shown in scripture, all things are being carried to their redemptive end, not by us, It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, Titus says, but according to his mercy, he saves us. Jesus is carrying all things to their redemptive end. And I find great hope in that. The heir of all things, the creator of all things, the radiance, the active radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of his nature. Back to Hebrews chapter one. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. There's two things there. First of all, he's a purifier, right? We know that. We know that Jesus purifies us. We've been uh, in in a study um, in Hebrews at our church in the last year. It's been a little while now. We've sort of moved on. But I love in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, talking about the completed work of Christ. Hebrews 9, 12 says, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He purified And he didn't just purify temporarily. He didn't just purify for a moment. It's not the kind of thing we have to go to again and again. He purified and sat down. The indicator there is that that's a completed work. It's something that he did in the past that does not have to be repeated, but it's perfect purification, final. Jesus made purification for sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty. We're talking about a finished work. We're talking about his exaltation. We're talking about the fact that he is our king, right? That all of these stories, these redemptive stories, they point us towards the final word of God, the clearest articulation of God, the beautiful word of God in the person of Christ. And so it makes sense then that the writer to the Hebrews would say again and again and again, don't drift. Don't fall away. Don't take your eyes off of Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter two, verses one through three say, therefore we must pay closer attention. We must pay much closer attention to what we've heard lest we drift away from it. We have to pay close attention lest we drift away from it. You know, I think a message like this, I'm guessing, probably feels a little bit redundant to Bible college students, to seminarians, right? To professors and administrators in a, in a Christian environment. It probably feels like, yeah, yeah, the heir of all things, the creator of all things, yeah, yeah. He sustains it all by the power of his word. We get it, right? Neat. The danger for us is that we drift away from the clearest articulation of God and that we start focusing on one panel, right? We start focusing on one of these images. We start focusing on maybe the one we like the best or the one we find the most beautiful or the one we find most inspiring or the one we heard taught the best at some point. And we never take the next step to let us lead us to the intended goal. All of these things were just meant to be fragments of a story. They were all just meant to be types and pictures pointing to the ultimate revelation of God. And if we're not careful, if we don't pay careful attention to what we have learned, we will drift away from it. We'll move away from it. And then our whole life becomes unhinged. We end up in a little square, turning off of Richfield, onto Seminole, onto Plum, right? Circling back again and again and again. No, for us, one of the greatest things that you and I have to be thankful for is the fact that God has spoken in Christ. That he has clearly articulated the Lord Jesus to us and he is never going to say anything in the future 
that's greater than that. It's like dropping the mic, right? You see those, speaking of boxing, you know, you see those boxers the day before the fight and they get up and they're talking smack. I'm gonna drop this guy in four rounds. He's not even gonna be able to touch me and whatever. And then what do they do? They hold the mic out and they drop it and they walk off. What's the indication, right? You drop the mic. The indication is I got nothing else to say. Listen, Jesus is the way God, the Father, drops the mic in human history. He goes, that's it, I got nothing else. You wanna know, you wanna know who I am? You wanna know how I love? You wanna know what all this is about? What is this story that I'm writing? Here it is, all of these other indicators, as beautiful as they are, are signs pointing to the final revelation of God in Christ. And our lives continue to point back to Christ. They continue to point to the work of Christ in our lives. You know, if you've had the opportunity ever, I'm sure you have, to go and watch a, uh, an orchestra, a symphony orchestra, right? It's, incre- it's incredible that they can get all of those different instruments to play a piece of music all at the same time in one way. But if you go, you gotta go a little bit early. You gotta get there before the thing starts. And uh, there's something really incredible that happens that the concert master comes out. Not, not the conductor, the concert master comes out. It's usually the first chair violin. The concert master comes out and she stands up in front of the orchestra, right? And then the oboist plays an A. Right, plays an A, yeah? And the rest of the orchestra tunes to the A. It doesn't matter what kind of sheet music they have in front of them. It doesn't matter how much they've practiced. It doesn't matter how well they know the piece. It doesn't matter how experienced they are. If they don't all tune to the A, no matter how beautiful the piece of music before them, if they don't all tune to the A, they'll just make racket. It'll just be a cacophony of noise. Because each of the tunings are different. They choose the the oboe because the oboe is the one that's least affected by humidity and external pressures. The oboe hits the A, and everybody else in the orchestra tunes to the A, and because they all tune to the A, it ends up being beautiful music. The Lord Jesus is our A, right? If we are a symphony, each of us with different gifts and different talents, different callings, right? God has raised each and every one of us up for unique and special things. Each and every one of us have to be tuned to the A. If we're not tuned to the A, then all we end up doing as, as a body is sort of making racket. If we're not tuned to the work of Christ, the, the heir of all things, the creator of all things, the radiance of God's glory, right? the exact imprint of his nature, the one who is carrying all things to their redemptive end, who purified once and for all the sins of mankind and sat down completing that work. If you and I aren't tuned to that truth, then we're just making noise. So it behooves us then at Thanksgiving or any time, any time we walk into a room like this and we see all these indicators to remember that all of it is pointing to God's final word in Christ and that we, in the stories we're telling today, in the stories we're writing in our lives today, have to be tuned to that very same A. Otherwise, we're just making noise. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.